Okay, live, good. All right. Yes, well. we're live, Oliver. In the tradition that you do every every time, we are actually live. It's over to you. Okay, thank you very much. I can't let tradition die. No way. Welcome everybody to uh, yet another Journal Club, um, brought to you by Leaf and Lifespan.io. I'm Oliver Medvedic, broadcasting live uh, from New York City, which it's uh, raining right now. There's a tropical thunderstorm taking place. Um, and I'm calling in from Cooper Union um, at the, the Cam Maurice Cambar Center for Biomedical Research, um, of which I'm the director of. And today's a little different because we're going to be looking at a review paper. So one review article that's come out from the uh, Sinclair Lab. And um, not so coincidentally, we have just launched a project on our project page from the Sinclair Lab that is directly related to the review article that we'll be discussing, which is the importance of a molecule known as NAD or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide um, and its reduced form NADH and um, all the precursor molecules that the body needs that are essential uh, to create this molecule that is literally vital for our existence and the existence of everything that's alive on planet Earth. Um, so I know that sounds dramatic, but uh, that is the truth. Um, so we're going to discuss basically what this molecule is, why it's so important, um, and, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, should you be taking some of these derivatives or these precursor compounds yourself? I know there's uh, people um, here that, uh, that already take this stuff. And, um, and you know, what, you should, what should you perhaps be looking out for? Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to launch into the paper. And uh, what I want to first do is give a little bit of background about the molecule itself, because, you know, um, there's a lot happening with this molecule. Um, we're not going to be able to discuss all the biology behind it. The review paper is quite meaty. There's like 500 different enzymes that utilize this molecule to varying degrees. Um, and the paper really does a really good job of condensing and summarizing kind of everything that's known up to date um, about this molecule. Uh, now, let's switch over to screen share mode and I could kind of show you a picture of this molecule. Um, so I'm gonna, before I go into the paper itself. So actually, well, let me do the paper first. Let me just do the title. Let's introduce the title. So this is the paper that we're discussing right now, Therapeutic Potential of NAD Boosting Molecules, the in vivo evidence. So this is by uh, Lewis or Louis Rajman, Carolina Chwalek and David Sinclair over at the Paula Flynn Center for Biomedical, Biological Mechanisms of Aging at Harvard University um, and the Department of Pharmacology at the University of South Wales. And congratulations to David for being recently awarded the Order of Australia. So I just wanted to do a shout out right there. So it's a pretty meaty review. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna share another picture that I found online. So I think this summarizes the molecule. It's a little fuzzy, but it does a pretty decent job. Um, you guys see this? picture of a molecule of a box. Is it clear? Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay. So not the best res image, but it'll do. And I think it really summarizes nicely. Um, this is from a different corporate website, a different company that sells um, probably NR or some other precursors. But anyway, um, so this is, so when we talk about NAD, um, so as David mentioned, or as, you know, um, Rajman et al. mentioned in, in the review article, um, NAD comes in really two forms, and it's NAD, either NAD plus or NADH. And when this molecule was first discovered very early in the 20th century, um, you know, it's, it's really kind of main classical role is as a redox carrier. So basically it carries electrons. Um, and those of you who recall the Krebs cycle, you know, from your basic biology, um, when you eat food, you know, your, your food is, you're stripping electrons off of the food and you're being, they're being pumped into an electron transport chain and that's where you generate ATP. So most of your ATP is being generated in mitochondria and the NAD and the, and its reduced form NADH basically acts as sort of a bucket brigade for transporting electrons. So, um, that's an essential role. So every organism, whether it's doing fermentation, um, which is without the Krebs cycle in you know, anaerobic environments, or it's 
you using respiration in aerobic, you know, environments, it's using a, some molecule, either, you know, there's a version of, you know, a different electron carriers such as FAD or FADH, but usually it's also essential to use NAD and NADH. So basically transporting electrons, highly essential. So very, 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 very conserved pathway that is basically built into all of life. So when we talk about NAD and NADH, these molecules are pretty big and they're usually charged and they won't really pass through membranes, although there's some controversy over which cells these, these molecules can get through. Um, it's been mentioned in a review article that neurons can perhaps transport NAD+. So when we refer to NAD, we're either referring to NAD plus or NADH. So in this picture here, this boxed diagram, this whole molecule, never mind all these gray boxes, this is NAD plus, right? So it's nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So the nicotinamide is on the left side here, and the adenine is on this side. So this is the same nucleotide that you basically find in RNA. So life loves to repurpose molecules and use them for all sorts of different kind of functionalities. So you've got this kind of hybrid molecule that's connected via these two phosphates. So it's almost a mirror image, except you have nicotinamide here in lieu of the adenine on this side, right? Um, so this is NAD+, so you notice that this nitrogen atom here has a po positive charge. In the reduced form, you have two hydrogens attached here, and this plus charge goes away, and it becomes NADH. So basically can flip-flop between two kind of on-off states. Either it's carrying two electrons in the form of two hydrogens attached, which it's reduced, or it's not. It's given them up. And in this case, it's NAD+, right? So this is kind of its, you know, its two functional states. So, um, so this is really kind of the core molecule. This is what your body needs to either um, make um, from scratch using um, you know, um, de novo pathways, so making it from um, precursors like amino acids that you get through your diet, like tryptophan, or you can recycle this molecule as it's being used in a variety of different reactions um, and it's broken down. Uh, bits and pieces of this molecule come off and then they can be recycled again, right? Um, and it's mentioned in the paper that if, you know, that you have a, quite a lot of NAD in both versions, NAD plus and NADH in your body, up to about three grams of it, I guess, depending on how, how much you weigh. Um, but, you know, the precursors to recycle it, um, such as nicotinamide, nicotinamide riboside, um, or, nic or nicotinic acid, um, those are all, that group of molecules I just mentioned are also collectively known as vitamin B3. So it's really a collection of three molecules. Um, you only need about like, I think, 15 milligrams per day to survive. So that basically shows you that, that the bulk of that three grams of NAD is being actively recycled in your body. So you're not, have, you're not excreting this stuff, it's being re repurposed and reused. So when we talk about precursors and how this molecule is recycled, we can break down this molecule into different sections chemically. Um, so the molecules, so we're gonna ignore this side for, for a while, which is the adenine, this molecule, and adenine riboside and adenine mononucleotide. Um, there's other pathways that recycle this. Um, this is, you know, obviously used in nucleic acids. It's used, you know, ATP, for example. Um, but this side here, when we talk about molecules that you can ingest or studies that are being done, um, people are not ingesting NAD or NAD plus or NADH. They're ingesting um, the precursors or the building blocks that, that enable the body to recycle this molecule. And we're talking about specifically either um, NA, nicotinic acid, or nicotinamide, NAM, or um, kind of what's also av available by, co you know, by companies is nicotinamide riboside, which is basically this nicotinamide. And nicotinic acid is just this, but this is a carboxy group instead of an NH2 group. Um, nicotinamide riboside is just the addition of the sugar, this ribose sugar here, or a little bit you know, more built up nicotinamide mononucleotide, NMN, with a phosphate group attached here, right? Um, so these derivatives are, or these not derivatives, these precursors um, are much more, supposedly much more readily bioavailable. They can get into cells much more readily. Um, and it's been shown in a number of clinical trials um, that have been mentioned in um, this paper, and also tons and tons of animal studies particularly with mice and rats, um, that feeding these, you know, animals and feeding humans, um, you know, 
higher doses than you know what what you know the what's usually recommended to just survive, right? I said 15 milligrams is is like I think what you need to ingest every day to survive. But um, in these studies, people are taking 250 milligrams up to 1,000 milligrams per day, and you're seeing boosts of of you know. Uh, of NAD levels by up to twofold, right? Which then plateaus after a while. So we're, you know, so um, they basically higher than your, you know, your, at least here in this country, your FDA daily food recommended amounts, which are, are pretty low. Um, and why is this important, right? You get this stuff in your food. Why should we want to eat more of this stuff? Um, well, as I mentioned before, this molecule here is central to essentially almost everything that the body does, right? I mean, pretty much if you depleted all this in your body, you'd be dead immediately. It's as vital as water. Um, and the levels go down as we age. So, um, and as they go down, you know, your metabolic pathways slow down. Um, there's up several hundred enzymes that require this as a cofactor. So I mentioned kind of the, you know, the original discovery of this molecule is as an electron carrier, and that's a vital role. So without this molecule, um, transporting electrons to and fro um, in your mitochondria and elsewhere, uh, all metabolism would cease. But um, over the years, I think since the mid-1960s, um, it's been found that this molecule is used as a cofactor, meaning it participates in other reactions that enzymes um, catalyze. And some of these, the two classic, um, or two of the original you know, enzymes that have been or classes of enzymes are these um, enzymes called poly ADP ribosylases or PARPs, um, and also um, the sirtuin class of enzymes, which uh, most of us are familiar with, which are enzymes that uh, do a number of functions, but the initial um, enzymes sir 2 and, and the human sir t one um, were identified as histone deacetylases. And they basically are required to stabilize DNA and basically make it less prone to breakage. So obviously a big interest uh, when it comes to aging or anti-aging. Um, lots of studies in mice, lots of studies in yeast, and they require um, NAD as a cofactor. So they require uh, NAD to participate in the chemical reaction that's used to deacetylate or remove the acyl group, um, the acetyl group from lysines on histones, which are basically um, how your DNA is, is compacted in cells, and that promotes further compaction of DNA. Um, and of course, they, de they also, since then, it's been seen that they deacetylate um, other um, substrates as well. So um, for this and other reasons, this is a key molecule. Uh, we should perhaps basically maybe have like a molecule of the month or a molecule of the week. So NAD and, and both forms, you know, reduced uh, form um, and the um, non-reduced form, the oxidized form, which is shown here, NAD plus. Um, NAD would certainly be, you know, one of these key central to life molecules that, uh, that uh, everything requires, right? Um, I don't think there's a single organism that, doesn't, that cannot exist without, that can exist without this molecule. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen here for a moment. So I hope that was a a halfway decent introduction to this molecule and um, some of the nomenclature behind it. And when we talk about this molecule, for the most of the paper, this paper we're going to not really talk about NAD or NADH. We're going to really talk about those sections of the molecule that are recycled that you can pretty much get in tablet form in most places, you know, starting with your local vitamin shop that sells vitamin B3, which is a complex of nicotinic acid, I believe, nicotinamide and NR, nicotinamide riboside to varying concentrations, to purified forms of one of those um, precursors, such as nicotinamide riboside, and even nicotinamide mononucleotide. Um, so, uh, yeah. And um, we've got a whole host of comments as well today. It's definitely a hot subject. Yeah. Um, so where should hot, we start? Hot, hot, no pun intended, right? If you take nicotinic acid. Exactly, exactly. Uh -huh. it's, har, har. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. You're in good form, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, let's see who, who's commented. We've got uh, Elena, who you may already know. 
She says, uh, can you uh, speak a little bit louder as your mic's a little bit quiet? Oh, all right. Um, Should I repeat everything? No, no, I, I think it was all right. It's just okay. maybe move the mic a little closer. All right. Um, we've got a few uh, requests. Uh, Kent in the chat has asked, could we please explain the transport into the cell mechanism after an oral dose is taken? And... Did you want to do that one? Because we've got a couple of comments here. Sure. I don't know much about it, but I can certainly go to refer to the paper, which um, we have read here. And let me go screen share. And uh, you guys can chime in some more because, uh, like I mentioned, uh, transport is still being worked out depending on the cells that we're dealing with. And I mentioned that neurons can potentially in, in, you know, uptake NAD extracellularly, but I'm going to scroll through this paper, and here is uh, <laughs> a very busy diagram, primary pathways of NAD metabolism, um, and there's probably more cleaner diagrams out there on the internet, but it basically tries to jam-pack everything in here. So um, here is a membrane. Um, I guess these are supposed to be phospholipids, um, and here we have a eukaryotic cell interior with a nucleus, cytoplasm, mitochondria, with in green you see salvage, 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 and that just basically means that the NAD is being recycled from these kind of subcomponents or these precursors. So, and these um, these terms here are different enzymes that catalyze these reactions. Conserve, you know, convert uh, nicotinamide to nicotinamide mononucleotide. You know, and and then NAT then adds other groups that recycle NAD. Um, here, some of these essential precursors um, are taken up by transporters. So there are transporters in the membrane. So here we have one. So these are, um, is it heteronuclease transporters, ENTs? I'm trying to remember the, the um, uh, what ENT stands for. Um, something nucleotide transporters. I want to say entero, but I'm probably wrong with that. So here we have a class of transporters, question mark, meaning some of them are not identified. So nicotinamide riboside gets transported in. Uh, Na, nicotinamide gets transported, or is that nicotinic acid? Some of the terms throw me off. Nicotinic acid, Na, nicotinamide is NAM, yeah. Um, so the acid derivative, so there's another group of transporters here which can transport Na. Tryptophan, which is an amino acid, and that's actually used in the de novo synthesis pathway. So tryptophan gets converted into a couple of different intermediates, and then another enzyme, QPRT, converts it into uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, which then gets converted to nicotinic acid, adenine dinucleotide, and then converted to NAD. So, um, so you can see that there's some question marks regarding how if some of these other, so NMN, I'm not sure if there's a transporter that's known for NMN. Um, it is known that it is taken up in cells and it's converted into NAD. So clearly if you, you know, through clinical trials and also mouse trials, if you feed mice um, NA or if you feed mice NMN or if you feed mice NR, it does get into cells. You do increase levels of NAD. Um, so there are different classes of transporters that are required to be expressed and you know um, found in the plasma membrane to take these things up. Um, I don't know how readily NAD. So here's a image. I think CX43. I'm not familiar with this transporter that's required to take up NAD. Um, this might be highly specialized to certain cells because it was mentioned in the paper that there's a couple of studies cited where um, perhaps only neurons, and I don't know if every neuron can do this, can uptake um, NAD. And I don't know if it's just the, here it's, it's being shown as NAD+, plus, which is the oxidized form, whether it's NAD+, plus or both NAD+, plus and NADH. I'm not sure about that. Um, but most of the NAD is, most of your NAD is found within cells. So there's very little in the extracellular matrix. There's very little, I think, floating around in your blood plasma. So most of it is, you know, most of it is utilized within cells, internally in cells. So, yeah. Stop sharing this. Well, maybe I'll just scroll down here, see what else is here. Yeah, and uh, uh, regarding uptake of NAD+, plus, um, there was a paper um, also in mice, of course, showing that cardiomocytes um, 
also potentially uptake NAD directly. So they may have mm. they they may have a transporter as yet unidentified. There's a lot there's you know there's a lot of research out there suggesting that there are transporters um, that you know have just not been identified yet. So you know it could be cell type or you know, t cell or tissue type specific or under certain circumstances as yet not ascertained, which is why it's really important for us to do this, you know, this sort of research and find out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for, for, for my two cents, I'm probably going to mention it again later, I think all the precursors are important, the, uh, the, the, the precursor molecules, and I think they're all relevant depending on the context of tissue that they're used in. That, that's my two cents on it anyway. Yeah, and as you mentioned before and also mentioned in the paper, um, some of the precursors have certain, uh, certain bioactivity, um, you know, certain types of bioactivity that's not present in other precursors. So it's not just this one pathway that goes from, you know, nicotinic acid to, you know, nicotin, nicotinamide riboside to nicotinamide mononucleotide to NAD and, and, and they, you know, and wherever you stick something in, it's, it's, it's all going to function the same way. Um, nicotinic acid, as you mentioned, and I was mentioned in the review article, Steve is, you know, it, uh, it's been known for a long time to reduce cholesterol levels. And that's not the case evidently for NR, I believe. Right. That's right. And, um, you know, other studies have also shown, um, Back to the sort of tissue uh, dependent uh, nature of it, we, we, we've had studies where I recall that I think NR was better in the liver, but NAD was shown to be, uh, NMN, sorry, was better, uh, was shown to be better uh, in the kidney. Yeah. So again, it, it, it is definitely supporting the, uh, the idea that different cells work in different ways i might have i might express different transporters or different percentages of transporters you know so they might some cells might trans you know again i'm tossing this out there certainly that you know i mean with this example given with neurons and cardiomyocytes with nad being the exception that that can get into those cells um cells do express different transporters so um you know i think the big ones that people are talking about here are are nr um, but certainly NA is much cheaper. And, um, you know, it, if you do take high doses, I think you're, the only side effect is hot flashes because of release of prostaglandins, which are these chemicals that uh, would use. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say this because <laughs> it will come up. Okay. There is one other potential side effect of uh, taking high dose niacin. Uh -huh. um, th and niacin, it... just, just to back up, niacin is another term for nicotinic acid. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I mean, I, I'm using the the, the, the yeah. commercial name because nicotinic, in fact, historically, a little bit of history for you, nicotinic acid is obviously the real name, but when it was originally uh, discovered and, 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 and sold and marketed, they changed it to niacin because they didn't want uh, the nicotine being associated with it. So smoking is bad. We don't want nicotine. That's why the name niacin was actually created. I... I I, I say niacin all the time, but it's the same thing. But um, yeah, the, the side effects, potential side effects of niacin, if you take too much, very high dosage, there is actually a chance of liver damage. It tends to occur, and I can't stress this enough, it tends to occur in general with the sustained release niacin, or what we call no flush or non flush, or delayed release. It's got a variety of names. And it, it, it tends to claim that you don't get a flush from it, which is true. But the problem is it hangs around the system for a long time and the liver really doesn't react well to it. Mm. Whereas upon, it seems to be that a high dose of niacin over a very short period, the liver can actually handle it. So do be very careful about if you are thinking about, you know, self self experimenting with niacin because it's very cheap. Do avoid the no flush stuff. Um, you are going to burn. What will happen is you will flush. You will have like a hot flush almost uh, if you take niacin. That's why you'll know it's the real the real stuff. Um, other side effects. Um, there was actually a meta analysis done, uh, in, which included a number of clinical trials in humans, um, and they did show that there was an increase potentially of the chance of getting diabetes type two. So there is a, a small, but there is a significant 
correlation with an increased chance of diabetes. Now, bearing in mind, we're talking about you'd have to mainline the stuff. And we're so, talking about we're talking about we're talking about niacin or nicotine, I guess. We're not talking about NMN potentially. No, we're we're, we're talking only here about uh, about niacin or NA or nicotinic acid. But there is there is a, a potential risk if you take a lot. You've got to mainline the stuff. You know, you literally you'd you'd have to have spoonfuls and all over your cereal. You, you'd have to take a lot. But if, well, in order to reduce <laughs> lipid levels, they typically use dosages of multiple grams a day. I think six. I think six was the six was the apps. I think six grams was the absolute upper limit, and that's where it is 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 really bad. I wouldn't go above. I mean, personally, I wouldn't go above a thousand a day, yeah. and that's a lot. Yeah. So, so as I mentioned earlier, yeah, the clinical trials that have shown, um, you know, physiologically, you know, significant increases of, um, and I think they were measuring in the bloodstream NAAD, so nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide, which is an intermediate um, molecule which is used as a proxy for NAD levels. You know, um, I think the max doses they were giving were like a thousand milligrams, which is a gram a day. And you know, if you talk, look at some of these companies selling. These products, like, and when I say products, I mean NR, nicotinamide riboside, which seems to be the more popular one, albeit much more expensive than NA. Um, we're, we're talking like recommended dosages of like 250 milligrams. Um, so 250 milligrams to like 1,000 milligrams. Um, so, you know, um, pretty high, but, you know, much higher than the FDA recommended daily now allowance of 15 milligrams, but certainly hell of a lot less than six grams. Um, so, uh, oh yes, yes. I've just uh, I've just put the um, the actual relevant meta analysis study in the chat for people who are listening uh, to check it out later. So if anybody's interested in that, do check out the results. But it did they did conclude that it does have a small but significant uh, increased risk for diabetes there if you do take a lot, but it has to be a lot. Yeah, niacin, right? Niacin, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So, I mean, from, from what I've read so far in other journal articles and this review paper I've just read, you know, thus far, um, you know, to me, it, it seems like this, these are one of these low-hanging fruit molecules that people, you know, you know, I'll just speak for myself. Um, I think I'm going to start taking one of these precursors just because it's, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, there's tons of data suggesting that it works. And there's already been clinical trials suggesting that it has beneficial effects. And, um, and it, well, I don't know if I'll take a cocktail. I mean, I, I certainly would probably take NMN or NR. Um, you know, I don't know if I'd be taking high doses, dosages of niacin. Certainly the B3 complexes, you know, there's probably not enough of these, you know, in the pill form that, that you're getting. Um, because based on the data that's out there, you know, we're talking you know, let's say an average dose of 500 milligrams a day, which is pretty high um, to kind of significantly to really see a boost in your NAD levels, right? If you're, if you're an older person um, and, you know, I don't think you need to be old, old to be taking this stuff, right? You could be pushing early middle age um, like myself. Um, and, you know, it's your NAD levels do drop and, and, the, you know, we can touch back to the paper as to what what are all the things NAD does. But I mean, the you know the list grows every day. I mean, it is you know it's an ancient molecule. It's required for many many metabolic pathways. I mean, um, it's it's just so fundamental to to maintaining homeostasis in the body, right? So having having levels drop, um, you know, and they do drop um, as we get past their 20s and 30s significantly. Um, the, you know, I'm thinking about this uh, human study that they did, uh, but they, they failed to see any difference in uh, like exercise capabilities, for example. Which, which, which study is that? It's a study from uh, March uh, this year. You have seen it. Ah, March this year. Um, I didn't read this one. I'm, let's see. Let me scroll back to this paper here and see what I, uh, let me pull up the, maybe we can share that one and see if, see if we can figure out why that's failed. Um, I'm gonna skip through a lot of these 
things here to kind of get to the end of this paper, which talks about some of the studies, immunity, so all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff, human trials, okay. Um, so they talk about NAD boosters. Um, so, so in this, in the review article, NAD boosters is anything that can upregulate NAD levels. So it's not just related to, um, you know, so there, you know, people talk about inhibiting molecules that, that utilize NAD. I'm not sure, you know, you know, they mentioned in, in, in a molecule, a, a protein called CD38, which is required for it, the immune system. Um, it's pretty important. Um, CD38, oh, uh, sorry to interrupt, I'm just going to yeah, jump in there. My and then, uh, supplementation. Hmm? This is a chronic nicotinamide riboside supplementation that they did in March. Mm -hmm. If you have read that study. No, I did not read that study. And they said that it had zero effects on zero any effect on exercise capabilities. And mm -hmm. what are we talking about here? How many people, how much are they taking? Or uh, 60 people, 60 people between 55 and 79 years old. Uh -huh. And they were taking what, like high doses, like 250 to a, a gram a day? Exactly. They were taking that amount. Uh, I got to read that one because... Yeah. Um, For six weeks, so quite some time. But CD38, uh, by the way, it's worth noting that in 2012, as I recall, uh, David Sinclair did an experiment with our old friend Quercetin. Uh, which is a senolytic um, compound. And he also used apigenin, which is a, a, a related compound, which is from chamomile. And he found that those two inhibit CD38. Now, CD38 is also one of the constituents of the secreted uh, factors from senescent cells, SASP. So it was interesting that... Um, in the experiment, when they used those two compounds, that it reduced inflammation and pushed levels of CD38 down. And what was great about it was they also demonstrated that NAD, uh, NAD levels uh, bounce back. So once you push down the, in, uh, the inhibiting uh, CD38, NAD bounces back, which is interesting because it then it suggests also that if you reduce systemic inflammation, NAD levels may also um, replete themselves too. So senolytics possibly may even have some effect on NAD uh, biology based on, you know, on, on, on the CD38 research that Sinclair did and what we know about SASP. Yeah, so I'm just looking, I'm, again, I'm just looking at this paper here. So one, one, a couple of papers in, uh, in the uh, human trial section. Obviously, this is not thorough and, you know, there's, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov to look up what's taking place now. Um, so never minding the pharmacokinetic studies which show that NR raises NAD, um, we obviously wanna know, does this actually help, right? So who cares if your NAD levels go up if nothing really changes. Um, there's this Heilbrunn study from 2017 which reported positive effects on, and on vascular endothelial function in healthy middle-aged and older adults um, and they, they don't mention here which of uh, this, there's seven other studies underway assessing the effects of NR on muscle mitochondrial function, cognition, immune function. That's probably right now, um, somewhere in these, uh, buried in these clinical trials.gov. But Victor, you said that one study that just came out now said there's squat benefits, but I mean, what, um, just kind of surprising considering all the positive stuff for mice and how well conserved, you know, NAD is as a molecule. So um, I have to read that study. So maybe if you can, uh, if you send me a link to it and maybe I could pull, yes, up, the, he'll pull it up. Oh, sure. okay. And um, it was a thousand milligrams, so very, a very high dose of nitrogen. And, and, and what were they looking at as a, as a, as a endpoint? Were they just looking at running on a treadmill or, I mean, I don't know. Yes, they were, yes. Okay, um, let's see. So did you, uh, yeah. oh, so here it is. Okay. Let's take a look at this. So I'm just clicking on this link here. Um, if I can comment. Um, so there is also this uh, muscle uh, numped uh, knockout mice. So numped is one of those enzymes uh, involved in the, um, um, uh, the salvage pathway of uh, NAD. So if you knock it out, 
then NAD levels decrease by 80 to 90 percent. And these animals uh, show progressive muscle dysfunction when they age. Uh, and if you give them uh, nicotinamide riboside, uh, it's reversed. However, if you then uh, measure NAD levels in these uh, mice, you will see that the increase in NAD levels is really small. So these mice still have very low NAD levels, yet are normal, showing that actually, you know, um, you only need a small amount of NAD to have normal muscle function. So that could explain why giving more uh, uh, and are to, to normal humans may not boost exercise capacity. There also, it also ties in with the uh, Sinclair research earlier this year about the sirtuin mediated crosstalk between epithelial cells in the blood vessels and mus uh, muscle, muscle tissue. They essentially explain the link between NAD and, and age-related sarcopenia, which is a, a regular steady loss of strength and muscle mass every year. And that's what leads to frailty. And uh, they found that NAD level restoration was important for encouraging the endothelial cells to create new microvasculature to feed the muscles. So they think that um, as you get older, uh, as as CD38 and other inflammatory factors build up and inhibit those signals, it means that no new microvasculature, little veins and and blood blood capillaries are not formed as easily. So that means that the muscle tissue, as you get older, isn't getting the nutrients and and and, and supply it needs from the bloodstream. So that's very interesting. And again, as Oliver said, it's one of the many many. Uh, the a myriad of functions that NAD performs. It's it's crazy what it does. Yeah. So I'm I'm so I'm pulled up the paper right here, which is uh, fortunately not behind the paywall. Um, and the, the author authors seem to be cautiously optimistic. Let me see. Is this the right paper I'm clicking on? Uh, hold on a second. Uh, I think this is the one. Yeah. So this is the paper, chronic nicotinamide riboside. So NR supplementation is well tolerated. So this just came out uh, March of 2018. Well tolerated elevates NAD in healthy middle-aged and older adults. So uh, they looked at a number of cardiovascular uh, functions. So they explained how they did the trial. Um, it was uh, 24 subjects. So this is 24 subjects who completed the trial. Um, it was... Um, how long did they do this trial for? It was probably not very long. Um, basically, they initially saw some positive effects, but then they said they, they did some further normalizations and those effects went away. Um, essentially, what they mentioned at the end of the paper is even though NAD levels do go up and it's well tolerated by all of the individuals in this trial, um, the particular cardiovascular functions that they... Um, uh, I'm just going to cite something from the paper here. It says, collectively, these findings indicate that chronic NR supplementation effectively stimulates NAD metabolism in healthy middle-aged older men and women. Effect of NR on indicators of cardiovascular health, which basically looking at um, blood pressure, for example, they did notice trends that were positive, and then, but then they said they, the com these comparisons were not statistically significant after correction for multiple comparisons. So I don't know what those corrections were. They do stress at the end of the paper that these were all healthy adults with normal blood pressures for their ages. And these were not, um, they don't know if this trend would be more observable if somebody had, um, you know, uh, worse than average blood pressure or worse than average um, uh, vascular endothelial function. Um, Again, they mentioned this, and I, I don't know what corrections they made. They say, we also observed a trend towards a reduction in the mean carotid femoral pulse wave velocity, which is basically um, measuring for um, artery stiffness, right? Um, and the clinical gold standard measure of the stiffness. Um, again, they, they did notice improvement, but then again, they say this reduction was not statistically significant after correction for multiple comparisons. Um, so I don't know what that means. Does it mean that they need to have more people in the trial? Um, because in the 24 people that they had in the trial, 
they didn't know to, they did not notice after these corrections a statistical difference in um, the um, vascular functions that they measured. So basically, that's what they looked at. They looked at um, looked at a couple of other parameters, body mass index. But how long did they do this trial for? Small initial intervention trial. Six weeks. Six weeks. So it was a six-week trial on healthy adults that were, um, they probably have the ages somewhere, but middle-aged and older. And um, again, uh, 24 of these adults. So um, so 500 milligrams twice a day. So, you know, pretty high. Um, um, so the take home from this small trial is that, you know, Nothing, nothing bad happened to these people, and the NAD levels did go up. Um, but what they measured in these people from ages 55 to 79 that were healthy for their age cohort, their age group, um, you know, that they're, you know, that they didn't, that they didn't lose weight in six weeks. They didn't, uh, they, they, their vascular function didn't improve in six weeks statistically. Um, so what does that mean? Does it, you know, again, they, you know, they mention here that uh, perhaps you would notice a statistical difference if you had people that were not entirely in optimal health, um, or maybe if you had it go longer. Um, they do mention that, you know, you get a lot of robust effects when it comes to these measurements in mice. But then again, usually these mouse models, these mice are much sicker um, and you use mice that are, um, uh, you know, some sort of disease model, and it seems to be improvement. Um, so blood pressure effects. Again, you seem to have a trend, but then again, you've got these big error bars here that are quite large, you know, so blood pressure, for example, systolic, diastolic, um, and this is NR and placebo. So, you know, would this, dis would this be statistically relevant if we went from 24 people to 240 people? if you had a broader range of people, um, I don't know. Um, you know, they mentioned that there's a trend, but again, it's for, for the group they used and the time they used, it was not, so you're right, it was not statistically, um, uh, you know, a relevant change in cardiovascular function within six weeks. Um, why is that? Um, don't know, maybe, you know, maybe again, we could say, we could argue that perhaps, perhaps NAD levels, raising them is completely useless. Um, I'm going to hold off a little bit and say that I think that, um, you know, uh, just based on this one trial, the jury's still out and it is suggestive that you will get benefits. Um, but you'd probably need more people and a broader range of cardiovascular functions to tease out these effects, right? Because um, this is a fairly small trial, and you know, again, nothing nothing dramatic was noted here. Um, on the plus side, nobody got sick taking this, and you did it, it indeed increase NAD levels, right? So if your goal is to increase NAD levels by taking NR. Um, it's well tolerated and no adverse effects, at least, you know, again, only six weeks. So we're talking a month and a half here. Um, just scrolling through anything else that they mentioned here. What was the age range of the, of the, uh, the test group? Uh, 55 to 79, I think. Or, 50, yeah, 55 to 79. So okay. I don't know how many people were in which age, but it was basically, I think, both males and females. But gem, generally healthy, right? Yeah. So they mentioned, they stress here that these were all people that, you know, according, you know, I guess, um, you know, the healthy aged, right? So whoever, whoever falls into that category. So they had, they had already good blood pressure. They already had, you know, they already had, their parameters were already good. Um, so that, that may actually explain uh, the slightly lack lackluster results because... Um, if, if if they are relatively healthy, then we might surmise that their NAD so, levels might not be as low as somebody who isn't healthy. Yeah, so, so connected to that, I'm reading, again, straight from this paper here. Um, 
So it says an important goal of the present study is to identify clinically relevant physiological outcomes for future larger scale phase two clinical trials. The most promising result of these exploratory analyses a trend toward, was a trend towards an improvement in selective indicators of cardiovascular function. Compared with placebo, NR tended to lower SPB, so systolic blood pressure and aortic stiffness, two major independent risk factors for incident cardiovascular events and disease with advanced age in the overall group. A follow-up analysis suggested that this trend was most pronounced in individuals with baseline BP between 120 and 139 millimeters Hg, a subgroup currently classified clinically as having either elevated SVP, 120 to 129 millimeters mercury, or stage one systolic hypertension. The mean decrease in systolic blood pressure after NR treatment in this subgroup approached 10 millimeters mercury, uh, millimeters mercury a magnitude of change associated with the 25% decrease in incident cardiovascular events on a recent major antihypertensive drug trial in older adults. Um, so it does look like in this study here, they were able to parse out the individuals within their group that had elevated blood pressure. And that was the NR levels did have a more pronounced, I think statistically relevant effect mm -hmm. in helping those individuals. But again, they stressed to kind of get a much more cleaner result. You need a much larger trial. Um, so it's not as bad as I thought. So it's not, um, so this trial isn't a total flop, so to speak. Um, you know, if, if uh, it, it does, you know, if you're, if you're in strapping great health, health already, and it's, you're probably going to have a hard time seeing beneficial effects of NR, but um, if, if you do, if you are in a subgroup that has elevated blood pressure and other indicators of, you know, reduced cardiovascular function, you're going to see more statistically relevant effects from NR. So I do think that, I do think that this is still kind of a net positive, um, this, this trial here, the authors certainly are upbeat about it, you know, even though they say they control for a lot of things, you know, if they take the whole group together, those statistical effects kind of go away, but they still notice these trends and they stress that they need a larger, you know, phase two trial with probably 10 times more people. And then you could, then you could look at different categories of blood pressures and see, you know, you know, see which ones um, respond the best. So I wouldn't be surprised then to see a much more dramatic increase in people who have a worse cardiovascular function benefiting the most uh, from from uh, NR. Um, so um, so again, you know, small trial, but still, you know, uh, take home message. I think just from quickly skimming through it, um, NR at least the levels they they sh it, you know gave people does increase NAD levels significantly. It is well tolerated. And at least for the, for the small subgroups, and again, this is only 24 people in this trial for six weeks, the small subgroups that had elevated blood pressure, you do seem to see a much more statistically robust response from NR. Um, so, you know, I think NR supplementation probably won't help everybody if, you're NR, if your NAD levels are already pretty decent and you're doing other things in your lifestyle that's already kind of optimizing things. Um, but I'd have to read the paper a little bit more carefully and see, you know, what, what all the other people are already doing dietary wise. You know, if you're already eating lots of, lots of nutritious substances and your NAD levels are already kind of maxing out as much as possible, then, you know, again, um, earlier studies have shown that you know, you will reach a plateau of NAD. It's not like you can keep, you know, chugging NR and other precursors and see levels of NAD just go keep going to infinity. It's going to plateau at some at some point. And I think I think an earlier study showed pretty much a thousand milligrams a day. You're going to start to plateau um, after a week or so or two weeks. Um, um. Probably if you keep going and you take more NR, what is going to happen, and that's one of the concerns with NR supplementation, is that in order to eliminate it from the body, uh, it needs to be methylated. Uh, so then you, you pee it up to the urine. Uh, but that means you will see a depletion of methyl donox in your body. Yeah. So you could cause other metabolic problems in your body by taking too much NR. 
Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to overdose yourself. Certain, certain, obviously, certain vitamins are good. Certain vitamins are bad. Certain vitamins that are that are lipid soluble are, are will be toxic because they'll build up to high levels in in your in your you know in your body's tissues. Other vitamins like vitamin C, you'll just pee it out, and your you know urine is going to be fluorescent orange. So um, you know, at some point, you hit a you know diminishing returns, right? You can only saturate your system so far and you really don't want to push things to the point where you're, 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 you know, taking so much of something that it's, that you have free floating, you know, precursors that are binding to God knows what else. Um, I mean, to me, the cool thing about these small molecules is that they have an excellent safety profile. Um, they're kind of the low hanging fruit for anti-aging, you know, for, um, for, uh, or, Pro longevity molecules, um, and uh, they're all commercially available. And there's a number of reputable dealers out there already. Um, you know, there's you know, for me at least, short of the known things that you can be doing, if you're really really serious about you know optimizing your health, you know, um, basically eating right, you know, um, exercising, periodic fasting, certainly. Would probably be also adding some of these, you know, metabolites into your diet and, and raising them to, to optimal levels as to, you know, whatever the optimal levels were for you when you were in your early 20s. Um, and I, you know, and I think, I think that's, to me at least, that's the way to go right now if you want to kind of play it safe um, and, and uh, if you want to kind of be at the forefront you know, if, if you so desire to kind of experiment on yourself, but I wouldn't even call it experimentation because so many people have been already taking these, these substances for a long time and they have a, they have excellent safety profile, a hell of a lot better than Tylenol. Of course, I'm not going to get started on that rant. Oh boy. Oh boy. But yes, um, you'd hate it over here. That's available just so easily, but, um, yes. It, but on on that note of self experimentation, um, yeah, I mean, whilst you could you can easily obtain it, um, NR, it's not the cheapest thing. Hopefully, the prices will come down. Hint, hint. And with the pop, rising popularity of N uh, NMN, that doesn't trip off the tongue, does it? M and M, it doesn't really, does it? No. But uh, hopefully, the rising popularity of that will help sort of reduce the prices of NR and then you can pick and choose. But uh, yeah, you could easily apply a more scientific approach to it if you're so inclined, um, you know, measuring simple uh, parameters like blood pressure, which you you were talking about earlier. Very easy. I do it myself here. I've got a little, um, I've got a, let's, I'll show you. I've got uh, one of these blood pressure monitors. And they're surprisingly, um, they're surprisingly cheap. Um, they're, they're, they're really not very expensive at all to obtain. And, uh, yeah. And see, as an, as an aside though, if I were to, if I were to do this, I would probably have to pick some other physiologic parameter to measure because my blood pressure is well within normal. So, you know, I mean, will if I were to supplement myself with a thousand milligrams of NR a day for mm. four weeks, will my blood pressure get better than normal? I kind of doubt it. You know, would I see other improvements? I'm not sure. You know, oh, mm. I, I, I would look at other biomarkers. Really, yeah, I, w- I would probably have to look at certain biomarker. You know, you know, probably the, the thing to do is to look at a whole panel of biomarkers and see what's perhaps suboptimal and see if those levels improve. And I don't know what that would be off the top of my head, but uh, but perhaps off the top of my head, it would be something to do with memory. I don't know. Um, I mean, some, some simple things at home. I mean, you, you could do, you could look at exercise endurance levels, um, things like that. Uh, what else could you do? Um, you know, a lot of the things that were on the age meter, you know, like the functional aging biomarkers, you you could pretty much sort of keep a diary of of that. So whether you notice an increase or decrease of uh, exercise capacity or an endurance, uh, the blood pressure is obvious. It's something very easy you could do. Um, if you work with your doctor, perhaps, and um, it, I mean, in the UK, it's easy for me to just go around to the doctors and, and order a blood works. It doesn't cost, you know, because we've got 
socialized healthcare, I can say, look, I want a blood works. I want to look at CRP, a C, a C reactive protein, uh, you know, and I want to look at the liver function and I can literally go and tell my doctor that's what I want and they'll do it. But, you know, it, where you are is obviously going to dictate the sort of availability of, um, you know, what biomarkers. You might look at uh, blood glucose levels as well to see if they change in any way. Uh, cholesterol, you know, all, all sorts of things. Yeah. And and as as we mentioned before, not every precursor is going to be doing the exact same thing. Not every precursor is going to probably have the same bioavailability to different cells. And that's why we need also studies like David said, there's coming out with NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. Um, it might be, you know, we don't know what the optimal, you know, this or that is, right? I mean, we are, we, there's a lot of work that's been done on NR, but you know, um, is NMN better? Is it better as a, as a combination with NR, right? NMN and NR and, and perhaps some other dosage of nicotinic acid. Uh, I mean, you know, these things have not been optimized. Um, you know, these trials, um, the ones that we've cited right now, um, there's not that many of them. There's quite, you know, quite a few, but, and they're, they're all pretty positive, but, um, you know, there's more to be done. I mean, I'm very cautiously optimistic right now based on what I've seen with, you know, tons of animal studies have been done and the few human trials that have been done thus far, uh, at least with safety profiles and, and the ability to raise NAD levels. And based on, on that as a whole, in conjunction with all the animal trials, I, I would be shocked if, you know, if, uh, you know, it, it was like that one fluke study that showed that calorie restriction in monkeys like has no health benefits. And it's like, what? Like that, that just kind of like turns everything or, or that they didn't live longer, but they lived healthier, which made weird sense. And, and, you know, that was kind of a statistical anomaly, but, you know, uh, I think there's already a preponderance of data showing that, that maintaining, um, normal levels of NAD as, as it would be for a healthy young adult, you know, is, is kind of a, a low hanging fruit intervention along with a lot of the other stuff that I've seen until, until there's something that comes out that's shockingly contrary to everything. I wonder if you could <clears throat> be able to measure the, like an intervention with the NAD uh, by looking at the uh, sleep quality and the, how, how much sleep you need because yeah. people are fatigued. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, again, since, since, you know, obviously improving, you know, improving everything since, you know, it's such a critical molecule and everything is tied together in metabolism and brain health and also, you know, your circadian rhythms and, and cycles, uh, you know, sleep, you know, quality of sleep measure. I mean, there's a lot of devices right there on, you know, on the market that measure, you know, brainwave activity that tell you whether or not you're in REM sleep or not in REM sleep you know, that you can get a lot of these aftermarket things. So, you know, um, you know, that would be a great study, you know, to do right there because sort of sleep quality is directly related to cognitive ability and, and your ability of your brain to essentially cleanse itself of toxins. So, you know, um, sh you know, it, doing a study to, to, that would show whether or not elevated NAD levels improve, you know, the quality of sleep meaning that you, you're, 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 you know, longer in, in, in REM sleep and, and you're dreaming longer and, you know, your sleep is less disturbed. I don't know if anyone's done that trial. I mean, I, that would be a great trial. Um, you know, there's a lot of other tons of great trials that could be done. Um, the difficulty, of course, is recruiting people and, you know, collecting the data and, and all of that stuff. But um, I don't know. We've been talking about this quite a lot, doing these types of self self-driven studies and you know we've got a lot of intelligent people listening in and a lot of intelligent people participating and you know we don't have all the time in the world but um uh, i think here at leaf and lifespan.io uh i think i think we're getting close to a time where we could we could we should start putting together our own studies um at least you know testing for some some things and testing things that have a proven safety profile and then basically looking at a variety of other parameters and seeing if we can, you know, do our own phase two trials and, uh, and, and put the data, um, you know, up there. Um, we should be able to, you know, with all the masterminds we have here working on, you know, um, 
social media and the internet and, and, and getting, getting things, you know, getting people linked online, I think we should be able to put something together. Yeah, it's certainly possible via the cloud to collect biomarkers. Because tons, tons of people are taking this and, and the data is just disappearing, you know, and people are just, uh, you know, kind of self-experimenting and, and it's all anecdotal. And um, if you're going to be taking it anyway, we should just organize um, a variety of trials and, and uh, figuring, figure out a way to kind of optimize the collection of this data. Really, that's, that's the thing. Come up with a package that we can then give out to people and say, okay, follow these guidelines and, uh, you know, it's going to be like the Wikipedia of clinical trials. You know, at least you know, well, we could start with some low-hanging fruit. And I think, I think um, NAD precursors are, are certainly fall into that category. There's a bunch of other things as well, but, you know, NAD precursors are, are in that category. Yeah, definitely. And obviously, um, to that end, um, uh, NMN is currently um, in human clinical trials at uh, Brigham, uh, Brigham's and Women's Hospital next to Harvard. Um, they've already done a phase one study, I understand, um, and we're waiting for publication. That was the David Sinclair lab. And I understand that they're going into phase two now for efficacy, which which is going to be really interesting. Uh I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing the results of that. The, 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 the issue really with NMN at the moment, there's a lot of debate about NR versus NMN. And it, it, it's, it's a little bit silly, really, because there's just not enough data currently on NR, uh, sorry, NMN to make a proper or fair comparison, especially in, in terms of human studies. There aren't many NR ones either. So it, it's kind of like trying to compare apples and oranges. And if anything, this, this, this review that we started with, it really seems to suggest that cocktails or combinations may be the way to go anyway. So, you know, that's interesting. So, you know, obviously today we've launched um, on lifespan.io, we've launched with, uh, with the David Sinclair Lab, we've launched an NW, uh, not NW, NMN, uh, uh, mouse project haven't we uh, today and I think that's going to also contribute to that sort of knowledge and what's interesting about it is it's the first time that anybody's looked at NMN in relation to lifespan and I think that data could then help to fuel further uh, progress with human trials uh, and so on and so on and so then we can get a proper comparison and find out what's really going on you know do we need yeah. all the precursors my instinct tells me we probably do. Well, we've just been talking about precursors, but I just want to show people, um, I think I'm sharing the screen right now. Am I? Yes. Am I sharing a screen? I never know if I'm sharing a screen. Or is it just my face right now? Okay, now I should be sure. So here's a um, here's a, a table of basically classes of NAD boosting molecules. So we've been talking about NAD precursors, which is high up on this list. Um, but keep in mind that people are also working on things that are a bit more, I don't want to say radical, but I guess things that are more um, downstream, um, because there's enzymes that use NAD and you use it up. And uh, you know, there's a class, there's a um, enzyme CD38, which as we mentioned briefly, used in the immune response. There's poly-ADP ribosylase polymerases, um, PARPs, um, and inhibiting these enzymes that use lots of NAD might also have a beneficial effect. Um, I'm a little wary too much about inhibitors because obviously these PARPs and CD38 and um, all these other enzymes do perform other functions. Um, but here are, you know, linked to papers that show that, you know, you do see, at least in certain parameters, beneficial effects. Um, quercetin is, uh, you know, a plant polyphenol that's been used for some time. Um, I don't know if it's just a CD38 inhibitor. It certainly interacts with a lot of things. So you have to, you know, keep in mind that some of these molecules might have other um, targets, not just CD38. But we've been talking about solely, almost solely right now, NAD precursors as an NAD boosting molecule, just because I think that these have the best safety profile and they are um, readily available. 
So niacin being the oldest one. So here's all the health outcomes and references. And of course, NR, um, NAM, um, uh, I don't know what NAR is, nicotinic acid riboside instead of NR. So I guess there's, there's these guys here, these precursors are, there's no available data, but certainly there's positive available data for NR, NAM, and niacin. Um, but keep in mind that there's other ways to increase NAD, and that could be through the inhibition, either the inhibition of, of enzymes that use a lot of it, such as CD38 and PARP, um, and also molecules that activate enzymes that kind of are, are required in the salvage pathway to make more. And, but there's, there's no available data for a lot of these right now in any kind of clinical trials or, or otherwise. So, um, so, you know, so just keep in mind that the title of this paper is NAD um, boosting molecules, but we've been focusing on NAD precursors, you know, um, as kind of um, for obvious reasons uh, in the talk that we've been having right now. So I'm going to stop sharing that. Um, yeah. So it's a NAD world, really. It's, it's interesting it's, stuff. It's a nad nad world. It's a nad world. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I've got that tune in my mind now. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we we had quite a few more comments. Um, Ken has asked or met, uh, commented, "How do you know if you've reached your desired therapeutic level? Subjective, objective, whole blood levels increase versus intracell uh, intracellular. How is it measured, and is it available?" Um, well, I think they mentioned in, in the review article here that they measure as a proxy um, one of the precursors, which was NAAD, so nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide, and that was kind of present in blood. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that, that through other studies correlates with internal NAD levels. So, you know, otherwise you'd have to, you know, I guess do a punch biopsy and measure it in, in cells. But uh, you can measure, we can measure in other intermediates that are um, kind of more freely released in blood. Um, so then that you, you can measure that, I think, through a much more simpler blood test as a result. Um, you know, what are your optimal levels? I think that would depend on what your physiological response is. Um, certainly, you know, they say that you get a twofold increase, but um, what that correlates to in actual kind of... Um, solid numbers compared to so right off the top of my head i can't tell you what the average 20 year old has as far as nad levels or you know uh, when i say nad i'm including nadh and nad plus nad levels in their cell versus the average 40 year old versus the average 80 year old um i'm sure that data is available i, I just mm -hmm. have to pull it up someplace um so when we see when i say that there's a twofold increase when you're taking a thousand milligrams does that mean that as a uh, 80 year old, you get to 20 year old levels of NAD? Um, I don't know. Um, it's a good question, great question. Um, uh, I'd be surprised if the data is not out there. Um, that Those numbers were not mentioned in this, in this review article. But uh, those are good numbers to know. They would be quite useful, wouldn't they? Um, I'd be a bit suspicious if, uh, if you get, if you get, uh, some precursor therapies to uh, an 80 year old and suddenly they, they, they were sprinting off on a marathon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's certainly anecdotal data. I understand that David Sinclair's uh, father was, um, was not really that active uh, some years ago. And I understand that he takes uh, NMN and yeah. apparently now he's off hiking white, white water rafting and he's in his seventies. So, I mean, it's anecdotal data, but it, it, it's interesting nonetheless. And I, I, I hear quite a few positive things in that respect. Yeah, I heard he got attacked by a moose and punched it right in the face and knocked it out. No, I'm just kidding. I, I didn't hear that. I just that wasn't out. it a camel? Um, wasn't that Conan? I think that was Conan the Barbarian. That was Conan the Barbarian, and it wasn't a moose. He's not Conan the Canadian. No. Now, if he was... No, no, we're, we're, we're not going to go down a Canadian version of Conan the Barbarian. No, <laughs> that is just too funny to imagine. So, oh, and another comment we had was uh, NAM inhibits sirtuins, which I recall uh, reading at some point. I, um, 
I do recall that, that NAM uh, is not really very commonly used uh, by supplement uh, uh, takers because apparently it does inhibit sirtuins and you need sirtuins for uh, mediated crosstalk for things like your, uh, your microvasculature and muscle, muscle development. Yeah, um, perhaps. Um, I've got to re remind myself of, of the data for that and how much NAM you should or should not be taking um, to have these negative consequences. Like we said, different precursors, different effects, probably to do with bioavailability in different cells. Um, and that's kind of the most obvious difference uh, is the probably different rates of uptake, but uh, there's probably internal differences as well. You know, different cells have different concentrations of different enzymes, and we have multiple salvage pathways at play. So again, you know, this, despite all of this work, it's still early days. You know, there's been a handful of clinical trials, all net positive. There's been a ton of animal data with mice, um, kind of mostly net positive. Um, but there's still a lot to be done. You know, we really don't know what the optimal dosage is. I mean, we, we know, we know that for the most part, you take 500 milligrams twice a day, you boost your NAD levels. And if you are subpar in some parameters in the cardiovascular function, you'll do better. Mm -hmm. Right. But you know, is that the best way to take it? I don't know. You know, uh, there's, there's still much more work needs to be done to optimize this. And that's, and that's what we're trying to fund here at uh, lifespan.io and leaf. Um, so, you know, we're trying to push the boundaries here on, on these small molecules. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that if we look at kind of the spectrum of therapies that are going to be out there and improving people's, you know, um, lifespans, uh, certainly small molecules like precursors to NAD um, and other small molecules um, that have beneficial effects and other low kind of, you know, um, low risk interventions. Um, these things can be very easily plugged into people's lifestyles, you know, um, and it goes hand in hand with the whole concept of kind of bootstrapping society to um, eliminating aging altogether. Right. So it's like, Aubrey's always been saying Aubrey de Grey, right? You don't have to, you don't have to look at the cure to aging now or figure out how to live to a thousand now. You just have to every so often increase your average and maximal lifespan by a few years, right? Every, every year, or every couple of years, and you just keep bootstrapping that, right? And yeah. I think, I think these small molecules here um, are certainly the way to go. At least, you know, this, these are the, you know, the early promising indicators, these and, and other the molecules is, like metformin. Yeah. And what I would find interesting is, of course, if all this research could collaborate and implement everything in a single mouse, I mean, combine the, now the combine this analytics, combine, combine the metformin, metformin, right? Yeah. Add everything in the same mouse and see what happens. Yeah. You know, it, we, we could, right. I mean, you know, obviously big pharmaceutical companies aren't geared to that because obviously they, they're looking for the one golden blockbuster drug and you hear about arguments saying um, well you know we got to tease apart all the effects maybe one's not working maybe one is but you know it is sort of artificial in, in some sense how you bin like these therapies right because let's say let's say dietary intervention right people talk about dietary intervention is one thing you eat a good diet you, you, you live healthier okay that's kind of like a no-brainer right mm -hmm. But I mean, a carrot has how many thousands of different chemical compounds in it, right? Nobody's arguing that we parse the carrot into 10,000 different chemical compounds and test them individually just to test to see if a carrot is healthy, right? You either have a carrot diet or a non-carrot diet, and we just, we just artificially call it the carrot, right? Mm -hmm. So you could come up with some sort of polytherapy where we already know that, you know, 10 of these things or five of these things individually have net positive effects. So let's put them all together and, and see, do you have a synergistic effect or, or not, right? And, and if, if they're all kind of low hanging fruits, so to speak, if they all have good safety profiles, um, you know, for me as somebody who wants to live healthier or somebody wants to see somebody's dementia reversed, right? If you set up a, a, a study where you're taking 10 different things at the same time, and maybe five of them work and five of them don't, 
and you don't know which five work and which five don't, and they're all cheap and easy to ingest, then you can pare it down later. You know, what's, what's so, I, I, I kind of see where you're coming from, Victor. You know, I'd be, it would be, I think, good to see kind of a trial like that. And there have been some trials like that with dementia where they have done, done these multifactorial approaches, right? Where they basically looked at several things all at once, you know, improved diet, improved supplements, you know, supplements that have been known to increase, you know, brain health. Uh, but like, I mean, if you look at cancer research, you have the hallmarks of cancer, you try to target yeah. the hallmarks of cancer. Yeah. But you think the same with the hallmarks of aiding. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so definitely doing multiple approaches at once, you know, you would think based on the data that we have so far, you know, I would say that you're right, that doing several approaches simultaneously all at once should have a much more beneficial effect than, you know, taking this or that individually. Um, well, well, technically, you have, technically, you and, mm, technically um, we could partially implement uh, a repair approach to aging already with the technology that we've got. We could partially implement SENS uh, as an approach or hallmarks. We, in theory, we have the technology to do quite a few of the things and address quite a few of the hallmarks already. Um, I think it was Elena that was saying this morning that we, we've got the technology that we could potentially do some of these. It's the difficult thing is the combinational testing um, and, and trying to identify the interactions and what's doing what. But I suppose, you know, let's just go for it and, and, and just yeah. see because you got, we'll see, you've got cell analytics. Yeah, we, we've got that now. Uh, stem cell repletion, we can do that. What else have we got? Uh, NAD uh, uh, repletion, we can do that. Yeah. Uh, we can also reduce uh, ROS. We, we've got plenty of things that inhibit ROS. In, in I'm talking about mice here. Uh, what else is there? Um we can make a list. We can make a list of a lot of. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things. That that. Uh, oh, telomerase to address uh, telomeres. Yeah. So you know, a lot of the toolkit is already here. It's just that it's not. It it it, it hasn't all been brought together yet. But the toolkit's yeah. getting there. You know. And 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 just as a side, like talking about society at large, um, I I should pull up this study, but um, you know, we hear a lot about. Will these interventions benefit only a certain select portion of the population, i.e. the wealthy versus everybody else? Um, here's the thing. A lot of this stuff is fairly inexpensive and is affordable by most people in this country, considering that a lot of people waste their money on frappuccinos every day. Um, anyway, um, really the difficult part for me is people doing what needs to be done. Um, so there, there's a lot of dietary interventions and exercise interventions that everybody knows we should be doing, right? And there was a study that looked at basically compliance, meaning, okay, out of all the people, like, you know, do a survey, right? Ask people what they ought to be doing to improve their health. And most people will tell you, like, they, they know what they need to be doing. And when they check compliance, are you actually doing it? The number is something like, it was something like 6%, right? So it's like 6% compliance. So I think we have a bigger issue than, than you know, are these, will these technologies be freely available to everybody? A lot of this stuff is freely available. A lot of the information is out there. A lot of people kind of know what they should be doing anyway, but how do you, you can't force anybody to do these things, right? I mean, if we want society to be healthier, I mean, if compliance of things that are already well established to improve your life, which is, you know, don't eat processed foods and exercise at least 20 minutes a day, if the compliance rate is like 6%, you know, amongst people who already know this, then I, I, I don't really, I don't know how you can really kind of, you know, further kind of push this on people at some point, you know, people have to kind of take their own initiative and, and, and kind of do this. Now I agree. It's a little trickier with NR and some of these molecules because we have to, you know, you know, there, you don't hear about this in the news that often you hear a lot of crap in the news, but, but, you know, and, and that's sort of the goal. That's sort of what we're here at lifespan.io and leaf doing is sort of trying to function as a filter for, for people as to, you know, what's, um, 
uh, you know, what they should potentially be doing. Um, and I haven't seen a paper like that. So maybe we should blog about, or maybe we have blogged about the, the top five things you can, or we will kind of go out on the limb and recommend that you should be doing like right now um, that uh, most likely will positively impact your life and not cause kidney failure or sudden cardiac arrest. But I mean, imagine how angry people will be if you propose to using rapamycin, for example. I mean, if you look at evidence, it's clear it's not extremely uh, unsafe, but it's still. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't use rapamycin. I would for that reason, just because it's it's it's. I mean, the reason it's given it's to suppress the immune system, right? I mean, it's got a lot of other toxic side effects. So, we're not talking about stuff like that. You know, we're talking about things that, um, that I would be comfortable taking. And I would be comfortable going my, my mom to, you know. Metformin's got a very good safety profile. Yeah, metformin is really high, good safety profile. There are, um, I mean, there are lots of things. I mean, some of the things that I take, for example, uh, creatine, I take that as a supplement. And there's, there's a great amount of uh, data for that as well. It's got an excellent safety profile. I take that in order to try and reduce the effects of sarcopenia. And, you know, I'm 43, but I'm... Yeah, there you go, metformin. And I am aware that uh, muscle wastage starts in your 30s or, or possibly even before. So I try and, you know, low-hanging fruit, as you say, Oliver. It's And it, and it's cheap. I mean, you know, creatine is, is cheap as dirt. Niacin is cheap as dirt. I mean, literally, I mean, there's more expensive dirt you could buy from the garden centre. <laughs> it's yeah, rude. Yeah, 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 dirt, eating dirt itself, at least the, the high quality potting soil, that would be more expensive, probably. Yeah, unless you eat the dirt from Easter Island and then it's got rapamycin in it, potentially, which is where they found rapamycin. Hence, that's where it gets its name. But I wouldn't, I, would, I definitely wouldn't, um, I, I definitely wouldn't mess with rapamycin because it's such a powerful uh, immunosuppressant. Well, um, I mean, it's a dosage also. I mean, yeah. if you take like a fifth of the those then it might not produce that much side effects but it also depends on the individual i wouldn't be recommending some something to somebody who's also immunocompromised right from from taking like i i it's hard to speak for individuals and, and um um and that's why you need the networks with self-experiment groups yeah i mean you need networks with, with people who document what they are doing and how it's affecting them yeah but there are things that could be implemented already that are, you know, before we start tiering it up, you know, there's, I would say that there's a bottom tier of things that people could be doing that, uh, you know, that, like I, like I said, um, periodic fasting, not eating, not eating processed foods, um, not eating two hours or more before you go to sleep, right? Which is kind of a, kind of a, a trick, a good way to fast without really fasting, right? Um, all of these things have been shown to improve your, you know, cholesterol levels. All of these things have been shown to improve, you know, cardiovascular function. Um, getting your required amount of sleep and, 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 and make sure your, your REM sleep cycle is not disturbed because you have a, you know, a tablet with blue light shining, which is actually quite harmful to your retinas, you know, in your room. Um, then we start getting into certain supplements like, you know, um, NAD precursors, right? So these are all things kind of baseline that everybody should be doing just to establish a good healthy norm for whatever your body is and optimize it further. Um, but most people don't do that. Even that most people don't, don't do, right? So, um, you know, uh, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, I suppose it's all about commitment, isn't it? Um, and also, um, you know, compliance uh, studies have shown that, com ironically, uh, this, this is a bit ironic, but compliance actually falls um, with age as well. There were studies that showed that compliance, especially for taking medicines and things amongst the elderly, is, 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 a, is a particularly... Um, well, it's a, it's a vicious positive loop, right? Because you're, you, you, if you start, your memory starts to slip or, you know, your, your, your sense of time starts to kind of um, change uh, and it sort of feed back, feeds back on itself. Um, you know, I mean, it's, there, is no, there is no magic one set of things, right? Um, Victor, you mentioned support groups, you know, having, having, a, having a good social safety net, having a good social network, 
you know, having friends and family that care is important. Um, you know, I remember I was at a, this is kind of a way, way aside, but, you know, I remember I was at a kind of a conference at Google headquarters at Saifu a couple of years ago, and it was all about, there was this one con particular conference, everybody breaks up into these little subgroups, and they were talking about improving healthcare. And I remember I was, I was really tried to pitch this idea that was pitched at a TED conference where there was this uh, doctor from India who basically set up this network of volunteer kind of paramedics who would basically do house calls. And most people need medical intervention that doesn't require the full services of a fully qualified MD, right? So that's why we have EMTs and paramedics. And, and he had this kind of network of thousands of volunteers going around the country with their backpacks and do making house calls. And I thought that was brilliant, right? Because you, because not only do you have somebody checking up on people's health, but you also have, you also have this human interventions connection, which is vital for psychological reasons. Um, I just remember that the tech geeks there did not want to hear a second of that. They were all interested in basically having some sort of implants that would upload medical information back and forth to some sensor. They didn't want to deal with any human, right? It was just like, like I just want a sensor that tells me my blood pressure and my vitals, and I don't want to talk to any human being, like any, any human being, no human intervention required. And it was almost this kind of disconnect where you had these you know, I don't want to use the word elites, but you had people in the tech sector that were just sort of like really almost antisocial to an extreme and like wanted basically all their, you know, all their fixes to be purely from some sort of, you know, some sort of uplink, you know, via Star Trek and wanted, wanted to have as kind of minimized human intervention to the point of having almost zero human intervention. And that was the way of the future. Um, I thought that was nuts and that that's not how medicine should be practiced. But I don't know. It just seemed to me like that there was this kind of disconnect that, um, that, you know, you hear a lot of, a lot of positive things coming from, from, you know, um, the West coast and, uh, Silicon Valley. But, um, but it's I don't know. I mean, even though the, the medical establishment are traditionally trained or they are mainly preoccupied with the age-related diseases, but their training is not mainly on age-related. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, I, I mean, historically, right, uh, you know, aging didn't kill most people. You, you had communicable diseases killed most people, traumatic injuries killed most people, right? And um, that's, that's what, you know, uh, doctors specialized in removing arrows out of people's heads and making sure they didn't die of a separating wound right so that's that's where most you know and then and then their job is just to patch you up so you can so you can die at an old age naturally right so so if you look right now most people don't die of arrow wounds to the skull and infections arising from such arrow wounds but they die of cardiovascular disease they die of dementias they die of cancers they die of basically diseases of aging diseases that are fundamentally a byproduct of our metabolism, right? And, um, and you know, that's, that's just the way it is. Our, you know, evolution doesn't care about individuals. Evolution cares about populations, you know. Um, as far as evolution is concerned, we've, we're successful as a species. We've been around for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of years. And life itself has been around for billions of years. And, you know, all of the, all of the systems that have evolved to basically promote cells dividing and um, propagating um, have been successful. And the problem is, is that the cells that are considered to be terminal garbage our somatic cells, especially our neurons that hold all of our memories and thoughts and feelings, we've kind of grown attached to that. Um, you know, as far as evolution is concerned, that's no concern to it, right? I mean, our job is to kind of keep the species propagating, which it's success, we've been successful at. It. So why should, we, why should we lament the fact that the rest of our cells are an evolutionary dead end, right? Um, evolution has optimized the strategy where our germline is immortal and our somatic cells aren't. Right. So it's been working. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we are not satisfied with that. Right. Um, so our, our, our dilemma now is to come up with the same tricks that 
have been keeping our germline extent for, you know, essentially eternally, right? Can we do the same tricks and interventions for our, our terminal somatic cells um, that evolution has figured out um, for our germline? Um, and there's no law of physics that says we can't, and I think we will. Um, and, you know, and that's, that's going to be our next great challenge in medicine. And with these small molecules comes one small stepping stone towards that, um, towards that goal. It's optimism, aren't I? Yeah. But there you go. There you go. When, uh, when a genetic engineer, uh, engineer says, look, we can, we can do something about aging. It kind of makes me feel a little bit more confident. Sure. You know, I mean, obviously a, a general member of the public says it, I'm like, yeah, you know, but when people in the field and not, not just yourself, but a lot of people like George Church and David Sinclair and a lot of, you know, very big names in research are now, uh, you know, like Belmont and, and people like that, Bel Belmonte, I think, um, I think that's pronunciation. Um, they're all essentially now starting to say, look, you know, we can probably do something about age related diseases by targeting the aging processes directly. That, that really speaks volumes to me. Um, you know, it, it makes me slightly more optimistic about the future. I think we're getting there. Well, we need optimism, right? Otherwise, all yeah. is lost. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, imagine if everybody just you know, th thought it was pointless. I mean, you know, medicine wouldn't exist, would it? So, uh, yeah, and all this is, is is just medicine. It's, you know, it's just the next step. So, you know, hang in there, keep your NAD levels up, and, uh, you know, and, and do what you can, because uh, I think there's some interesting things coming in the future. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, NAD. I think it's the low hanging fruit and it's something that in theory is available right now for those people who are intrepid enough to, to want to sort of buy it. It, it. You know, it's not a controlled substance, uh, a controlled drug by any means you can buy it over the counter. Um, whether you think it's worth it for the precursor of your choice. Well, that's a relative question, isn't it really? Whether something's worth it or not. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit too expensive for my liking, the uh, NR and NMN at the moment. Yeah. But I'm optimistic there's going to be quite a lot of competition in this field soon. So we might, we might see some flash sales. And that's when people like me hit the shops. Yeah. And a disclaimer, I invest in none of these companies. So I have no incentive to make or lose any money on any of this stuff so um if if i was on the board of directors of any of these companies i'll let you know and you could hold my feet to the fire but i am not so um kind of wish i was really um kind of wish i'd have had invested early in in the nr and that that would have been great yeah um but you know you you just you just never know so uh, yeah so Anyway, I've just been told that um, things are going well with the NMN fundraiser that we launched a few right. hours ago on Lifespan.io. And you can check that out at Lifespan.io forward slash NMN. Very easy to remember that one. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm apparently uh, informed that we are just over, um, just hit 10% already. So. Yeah. Let's keep that momentum going. Yeah, there's a lot of want, interest. I want it to flag, and we want these trials to happen. And, you know, that's that's what we need to do. And that's what we're doing here is pushing the forefront of this research and, um, you know, making sure that we optimize everything that we can so we get to optimal health and uh, get to that escape velocity. Um, mm, yes, longevity escape velocity, uh, which is... I, uh, yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite happy living... For a very very long time in this healthy body, I'm I'm not really. Um, I'll I'll leave the um, what's it called the uh, what's that Ray Kurzweilian theme? Where we all get to. I'm not looking to become an amorphous cloud of energy. I'm I'm a biologist, so I, I'll I'll um, I'm happy with my with my meat machine right now. Meat machine that that just sounds wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna say wrong. Meat machine. Is that your stage name? 
no, no. <laughs> let's uh, let's not go there, guys. Let's not go there before we start uh, going down some very uh, very dark subject uh, topics. Uh, I don't know what you're thinking about. I'm. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you later. Yeah, we'll, we'll save that one for the staff Christmas party. Okay. All right. So, okay, uh, yeah, so it's been fun. It has been a bit of a, a more of a free range discussion today um, due to the nature of the paper. Normally, we, we, we look intensively at, at, at one paper, but we've had we've we've had a bit of a selection today uh, and almost a sort of uh, lifespan and longevity panel in general. So I've enjoyed it. I did, too. Uh, and hopefully everybody uh, watching has enjoyed it and, and, and finds it informative. If you did enjoy the stream and you, you might like to um, support us in a more personal way, um, if you consider becoming a patron uh, by checking out our her uh, Lifespan Heroes at lifespan.io forward slash hero, and that will uh, tell you how you can uh, support our monthly shows and uh, help us do more. And... Obviously, do check out the NMN project on Lifespan. And again, if you if you are interested in uh, getting involved, then please do so. And thanks for joining us. And we will be back probably sometime around the same time next month. Um, we don't know what we're doing yet, do we? But uh, but we'll, 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 figure, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And of course, if anybody does have suggestions, you know, for topics and papers that they like us to discuss feel free to drop us a line um, at the email address on the website by the contact um, section and, you know, suggest a paper if you'd like to see us discuss something uh, specific. And that's it. Thanks for joining us. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today, Victor and Sven. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's been interesting. And, yeah, we'll see you next time. All right. Take care, everybody.